Now, for a few moments, let's think about those verses in John chapter 5, 28 and 29. Up to now, we have understood Jesus' words to mean that the resurrected ones will do good things and some will do vile things after their resurrection. But notice there in verse 29, Jesus didn't say they will do these good things or they will practice vile things. He used the past tense, didn't he? Because he said they did good things and they practiced vile things. So this would indicate to us that these deeds or actions were committed by these ones prior to their death and before they would be resurrected. So that makes sense, doesn't it? Because no one's going to be allowed to practice vile things in the new world. So what did Jesus mean when he mentioned uh, these two factors? Well, for a start, we could say the righteous ones still, when they're resurrected, have their names written in the book of life. It's true, Romans chapter 6 verse 7 says that when someone dies, his sins are cancelled. But, take note of this, not their record of faithfulness. That's not cancelled. So the righteous ones are resurrected into the new world and their names are still in the book of life. Because there we could say the word judgment is not referring to a condemnation. It's not referring to something that is totally negative. It's true, at times the word judgment can have that meaning. But in the context of these verses, it seems that Jesus is using the word judgment in a more neutral sense. So it means more an evaluation or a probation period. We're watching Governing Body member Jeffrey Jackson at the 2021 annual meeting giving the talk, Are You There? And he has just unveiled some new light regarding John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29. I've gone over this multiple times because it's all a little bit complicated. And no matter how much I think about it, no matter how much I try and untangle what he's saying, I can't see this as being anything revelatory or any kind of huge deal. Ultimately, the outcome for the righteous and the unrighteous who are resurrected into paradise after Armageddon stays pretty much the same and you could argue both have more or less the same fate because they're resurrected into a situation where they need to be obedient or they're going to die. Which raises the question, why even talk about them in terms of two groups? If pretty much the same thing is happening, if neither group is guaranteed eternal life, What's the big deal? What's the difference? I've put together a chart or a visual, which Tibor will show you now if he's gracious. This is, as I understand it, what we've just been hearing from Jeffrey Jackson. The previous understanding of John chapter 5, verse 29, is that when Jesus was talking about those who did good things and those who practiced vile things, he was talking about things that they will do during or by the end of the thousand year reign, the outcome being that those who did good things and will continue to do good things will get eternal life, and those who practiced vile things will be executed either during or by the end of the thousand years. That was the previous understanding. The only thing that's changed is that these things, whether good or vile, are now supposed to have happened before their death and resurrection, the outcome being exactly the same for those who did good things, namely eternal life. The only slight difference, and it is a slight difference, is those who practiced vile things, instead of their execution being a certainty, 
They're on, as we've heard from Jeffrey Jackson, a probation period. <laughs> so there's a possibility that they could change their ways and get eternal life, whereas before, one way or the other, they were going to be executed. That, as far as I can understand it, is the new light. Wow. <laughs> it's taken the faithful slave over a hundred years to figure out that in John chapter 5 verses 28 and 29 Jesus was talking in the past tense. But notice there in verse 29 Jesus didn't say they will do these good things or they will practice vile things. He used the past tense didn't he because he said they did good things and they practiced vile things. Why is this only being noticed now? It's, it's the same as when we had the new light about the locusts at, I think, the 2019 annual meeting, when David Splain divulged that for the first time they'd been able to read the verses in Joel in context and therefore had realised that the locusts in Joel were not the same as the locusts in Revelation. How come it's taken you a hundred years <laughs> to read a verse in context, and in this case, to read a verse and realize that Jesus is talking in the past tense? If it's so obvious, why only now? And of course, Jehovah's Witnesses are told, oh, well, the faithful slave only realize the truth about verses when it's God's right time. Well, how is it in God's interests for them to be in the dark for over a hundred years on any important verse? How is it in God's interests for him to guide his organization by effectively lying to them and making them believe and print wrong information about a certain verse. The, mo the more you think about the whole New Light doctrine, the more it unravels. On this occasion, though, the New Light has only served to complicate matters. You'll have seen there Jeffrey Jackson rushing to address a conflict that has now opened up between John 5, 28 and 29, or the new understanding of John 5, 28 and 29, and the verse at Romans 6 verse 7. It's true, Romans chapter 6 verse 7 says that when someone dies, his sins are cancelled. But, take note of this, not their record of faithfulness. That's not cancelled. Not their record of faithfulness. That's not cancelled. Well, that's just word games, isn't it? I mean, let's look up Romans 6 verse 7. For the one who has died has been acquitted from his sin. When you die, your sins are acquitted. And yet here we're learning about two groups of people. Both groups have died and have been resurrected, but one group is being treated differently to the other group based on what they have or haven't done and what sins they have or haven't committed. If it's really true that when you die, you are acquitted from your sin, how can you have a double standard? How can you have one group with their names in the book of life in pencil and another group that's on probation? Jeffrey Jackson's solution is to play around with words and say, look, it's not about sin. It's about the record of faithfulness. Well, aren't we talking about the same thing? When we're talking about faithfulness, aren't we talking about the extent to which someone has either sinned or not sinned? Doesn't it all ultimately boil down to sin? So isn't it just word games to say, yes, God's view of the sin is the same, but he's focusing instead on the track record. It's just a hot mess, to be completely honest with you. And again, this is exactly the sort of thing you can expect when you just have lie upon lie upon lie. When everything is just a man-made fabrication, the more you discuss the details, the more the whole thing is going to unravel. 
And the more you have to come up with excuses, because when you change one thing, when you come up with a new understanding of something, all of a sudden something else doesn't make sense. All of a sudden you've opened up another problem that you've got to somehow account for and come up with some fob off, some excuse to explain it away. That's what Jeffrey Jackson's doing. And having already uncovered one problem <laughs> with the new light at Romans 6 verse 7, he's going to discuss another verse where there's a problem. So looking at Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2, it seems appropriate too that we adjust our understanding of this verse. Notice there it speaks about people waking up in the form of a resurrection. And this occurs after what's mentioned in verse 1, after the great crowd survived the great tribulation. So this obviously is talking about a literal resurrection of the righteous and unrighteous. But what does it mean when it mentions there in verse 2 that some will be raised to everlasting life and others to everlasting contempt. What does that really mean? Well, when we notice that, we notice it's a little different from what Jesus said in John chapter 5. He spoke about life and judgment. But now here it's talking about everlasting life and everlasting contempt. So that term everlasting helps us to realize that this is talking about the final outcome after these ones have had an opportunity to accept the education. So those who are resurrected, who make good use of these, this uh, education, well, they will continue on and ultimately receive everlasting life. But then on the other hand, any who refuse to accept the benefits of that uh, education, they will be judged as worthy of eternal destruction. Now, let's finally read verse 3. And those having insight will shine as brightly as the expanse of heaven, and those bringing the many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. This is speaking about the massive education work that will be done in the new world. The glorified anointed ones will shine brightly as they work closely with Jesus to direct the education work that will bring the many to righteousness. What a joy it will be for them to take part in this amazing work in their role as priests. They will assist with the healing of the nations, and what a privilege it will be to see obedient humans become free from the burden of sin and death and gain perfection. Of course, we have to realize that at that time on earth, there won't be just resurrected ones, will there? They'll be the survivors of Armageddon and any children that are born in the new world. These ones will ultimately attain to perfection. What a crowded planet it's going to be. Basically, everyone who has ever lived, with only a few exceptions, as I've mentioned previously, pretty much everyone who's ever lived being brought back, whether they're good or bad, and as I've pointed out before, we're talking a hundred billion on top of this, Jeffrey Jackson is hinting that there may be children born in the paradise. So we're now talking potentially over 100 billion on our planet. I mean, do they not pay the slightest attention to what's going on in terms of population and climate and that kind of thing and human impact on our ecosystem? They really think with the earth currently heaving with nearly 8 billion people, they really think our planet can sustain over 100 billion people kicking about, pooping, <laughs> eating, using resources. They really think that's sustainable, do they? Again, they've just not given this any thought, have they? And what on earth was that nonsense about Daniel? But now here it's talking about everlasting life and 
everlasting contempt. So that term everlasting helps us to realize that this is talking about the final outcome after these ones have had an opportunity to accept the education. Yeah, it couldn't just be that your teachings don't make sense or, heaven forbid, that the Bible contradicts itself. No, it must be that we can put emphasis on certain words, in this case, everlasting. Because the word everlasting is used, we don't need to worry about the resurrection after Armageddon. We can kick it all into the long grass and say it's talking about the final outcome, what's going to happen after a thousand years when Satan is released. Because, and by the way, that never sat right with me as a Jehovah's Witness. Apparently, God's plan for saving mankind from evil involves getting rid of evil and binding Satan and his demons only to wait a thousand years... <laughs> and let Satan and his demons loose again. What a convoluted plan. Just get shut of the whole thing. Just get rid of evil. You're God. You have the power to do whatever you like. Just get rid of evil people. Why this bizarre pantomime where you're resurrecting everyone who's ever died and giving them a second chance, but this time on a massively overpopulated earth, apparently their first life wasn't enough to decide whether they're good or bad. They need a second life in two groups, righteous and unrighteous, to decide whether they're good or bad. And it's not just about observing them during this thousand year period. We need to test them. There needs to be some kind of exam <laughs> at the end which we're calling the final outcome when Satan needs to be unleashed. Satan is like God's attack dog who can just be unleashed as some kind of weird experiment to find out whether people are good or evil. The whole thing is so convoluted and so nonsensical, but at least it's giving us this ridiculous artwork. <laughs> I mean, good grief. Hopefully Tibor is by now showing the resurrected anointed smiling down on Paradise Earth. Isn't it interesting how they're all white dudes? <laughs> they're all basically Kenny Rogers clones. I mean, how do you explain this? How is it that anointed ones, whether they are men or women, and no matter their ethnicity... When they go to heaven and start ruling with Jesus as the 144,000, automatically they become Kenny Rogers clones. <laughs> automatically they become white dudes with white hair. Why white hair? Why, why not, you know, brown, black or blonde hair? What's with the white hair? <laughs> it's... It's so ridiculous, isn't it? You know, we've, we've gone from the resurrected Bee Gee, who's decided to turn his back on staying alive, to a heaven full of Kenny Rogers, smiling down, knowing that the whole thing is going to descend into anarchy for a brief period once the thousand years are ended and Satan is let loose. But this is the good news. The majority of perfect mankind will find themselves passing the final test. Yes, and their names will be written permanently in the book of life. Isn't that exciting to think about what's going to happen in the future? Yes, now is the time Jehovah is preparing his people for this massive education work that is going to take place in the new world. So now is the time for each one of us to think about that question, are you there? Is your name in the book of life? Yes, may your name be found written in Jehovah's book of life and may it remain there forever.
Well, we sincerely thank you, Brother Jackson, for that very upbuilding and strengthening talk. I have to say, when the governing body discussed that information, uh, all of us felt so um, heart, it was so heartwarming to think of the time when the anointed will really be able to work with people on the earth and help them come to perfection. What a wonderful, wonderful moment that will be. Yes, helping people come to perfection. <laughs> what a moment that will be. He, he just has to make it all about him, doesn't he? I'm sorry. Mark Sanderson here, using his position as chair to at almost every opportunity impress people with his position and impress people with the fact that he's on the governing body and he was part of this decision. He has to put that reminder in at the end. But yeah, I'm sorry, I can't get as excited as Jeffrey Jackson and clearly Mark Sanderson are about this new light as we've already seen at its unveiling, if anything, it raises more questions than answers. What about that verse in Romans? How can you have two groups of people, both of whom have died and whose sins have therefore been acquitted, both being treated differently? One group having their name in the Book of Life in pencil or whatever... <laughs> and the other being on probation. They're sort of a lesser group. Their sins have been acquitted, but they haven't quite been acquitted because it's all about your record of faithfulness, which, again, as far as I'm concerned, when we're talking about faithfulness, we're talking about what people have done and whether or not they've done good or bad things, bad things like sin. So it, it's all so silly, to be honest. And what a breath of fresh air it is when you can walk away from all this and not have to square the circle, not have to constantly try to force a square peg into a round hole and just realise that the Bible can be interpreted any which way, can't it? You can take any verse out of the Bible well, almost any verse, and make it mean any number of things. You can come up with any theology you like. And it just so happens that the theology that Jehovah's Witnesses have come up with regarding the resurrection and the paradise is so ridiculous that it completely fragments under even the mildest scrutiny. <laughs> 